Before we begin, everybody, this episode has conversations about sexual assault, sexual abuse of children, and so just listen at your own discretion. Trigger warning. Well, 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 Chandler, we are back in the saddle on this Monday. We don't typically release episodes on Monday. We don't. Everyone, this episode, we are getting into Quiet on Set, the documentary that digs into the toxic work culture on really popular kids TV shows in the 1990s and 2000s, including The Amanda Show. We have Kate Casey joining us. We're going to cut to our segment with Kate after we kind of debrief because we really just got into the nitty gritty when we talked to her. We didn't top line anything. And so I would love to ground our listeners, Chandler, in a bit more of a cohesive narrative about what they can expect if they're going to watch Quiet on Set, which is a harrowing documentary. I mean, what they can expect. I mentioned this when we talked to Kate, but I was so sickened by it. I mean, I was mm-hmm. I was watching it a little bit on the subway yesterday and I was feeling, I was like, am I car sick or is this just like so hard to watch? Like mm-hmm. just making my stomach hurt. I was also just so, I was like overcome with emotion during the third episode because it just it's so harrowing and it just makes me afraid for the world and afraid to have children in the world and it's it's really it's a hard watch everybody so that's what you can expect (laughs) it's a hard watch basically what it gets into is the abuse allegations really at every level on these kids tv sets and obviously it's really dark that any of this happened let alone on children's programming you know behind the scenes These were adults that abused power both with the crew and with the actual children on set. And I think that there's just so much coming out right now about abuses of people in power. Um, Mm -hmm. We have everything that came out with Diddy. You know, I didn't bring this up with Kate, but I really wanted to. Cat Williams did that really important interview and really famous interview recently where he said, all these people... All these people who've abused their power, it's all going to come to light in 2024. And it is interesting. It seems like a lot of people are being taken to task over their misdeeds. In this documentary, it really gets into the harassment and the abuse of the employees and actors on these children's television sets. So, Chen, where do we even begin, honestly? I think let's start with the abuse that the employees face. That's kind of the flow that the documentary follows. And I think let's start there. It's really interesting. They say that Dan Schneider started out really great. He started out funny and convivial and the sets were a blast and it was a great Mm -hmm. place to work. But over time, as he gained more and more power, they basically said that things got really, really terrible. Jeanette McCurdy talks in her book about this guy named The Creator. Um, yeah. And she doesn't name him by name, but I think everyone has basically you know, realized that that's who she's talking about. And something this interesting, she- really quick, something interesting, when she reads the audiobook, I actually think she lets the name slip. Oh, interesting. And that's, int- and that's like, I think, intentional. Mm. So Jeanette recalls pressures she felt from the creator to drink alcohol before legally being of age, to wear bikinis and get photographed while changing on set. She states that this person massaged her without her consent. And basically that this person created a very hostile work environment where he said things that were super degrading, like you'd be working at yogurt land if it weren't for me. Basically dangling it's people's funny. futures in front of them. Lauren, Lauren I know said what's that to me a few times. Oh, I thought you were going to bring up the fact that I worked at Golden Spoon. Oh, no. See, I, no, was, I was just going to not- say, you would say to me, you'd be working at Yogurt Land if I didn't have you as a co-host of my podcast. Yeah, right. When I was 14, no, I actually kidding. did work at a yogurt shop, Chandler. I wasn't a child star, and that's why I have such great character, okay? My star did not soar, that's for sure, as a kid. Um, but anyway, back to Quiet on Set. The abuses really take place in all sorts of ways. One of the ways that's really hard to hear is that you know, they basically offer these two women full-time jobs, but they say to take these jobs, you have to work for half the pay. So you're going to, we want two women to do these, this role, but we're only going to pay you each half of the salary. It's, and yeah, you have to it. split the salary. It's yeah. to be honest, there's a part of me that's like, do, do they still do that in corporate America? But instead of saying a half salary, they're like, we're going to start you at $37,000. Right. Yeah. In New York City. In publishing. Um, 
I doubt that they're as overt and maybe potentially corporate America, but I think in these entertainment jobs where you have to grind for so long for such mm-hmm. little money, you know, if you think about mm-hmm. people who are PA, people who have gone to film school, people who have done the education part of it, who then have to enter the industry. And then you are just literally bottom of the totem pole running and getting coffees for people for the first 10 or 15 years of your career, just hoping that someone's going to look at your script or, you know, you're finally going to get to like get a mentor and start to actually have the career that you want. Yeah, it's completely demoralizing. And so these people are put in the situation where, you know, they'll take so much less than what they're offered. Yes. And they continue to, they talk about how one woman says, you guys won't believe this. She says that she's telling a story about something kind of embarrassing that happened to her in high school. And Dan Schneider in a writer's room full of men says, will you bend over like you're being sodomized and tell that story? Uh, you know, keep telling the story, but I want to, I want to see you bent over telling that story. Right. He's like, you know what would make this even funnier? If you were to do that. And she does it. And she does it. And, you know, I just have so much empathy for these women because we all know as a woman, you know what it's like to be the the girl in the room with guys where you don't want to be uptight. You don't want to be the frigid bitch, you know, where you want to be like, cool. You want to be like seen as, as one of them who can laugh at stuff. And, and so in this moment, I'm sure they're just like frozen. And it's just like mm-hmm. a, a fight or flight moment where you're like, I'm either going to cement myself as a bitch who's uptight, or I'm, I'm going to job. just like get this over with and whatever, you know, whatever. And I think that that's something a lot of women face is jobs can end up being boys clubs, right? Where because mm-hmm. you're not on the golf course, because you're not in the steam room because you're not cold plunging with the guys you're not part of the crew that hangs out right. you miss out on deals you miss out on opportunities you don't build certain relationships just by the nature of you know certain gender barriers right. um and i think that a lot of that comes down to you know how cool and likable are you to have around and to risk your likability in order to stand up for what's right or to mm-hmm. not, you know, degrade yourself can be too high of a price for people that are supporting their families. And so, yeah, it was really harrowing to hear these these women's accounts of the abuses they endured while just trying to work their dream jobs that they weren't that yeah. they couldn't just replace if they got fired. Right. This is a trite sentiment, but you know, you just have to work twice as hard as a woman. And I I don't want that to be something I think about often or like my narrative, but that is just a reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that another tricky thing that these writers face is they're put in a situation where they need to green light and co-sign putting these children into scenes where they are depicting graphic sexual pornographic content. On these shows, there is cum shots, clear cum shots, okay? that are, you know, it's mimicked with jelly or something something else. Um, there is Ariana Grande gripping a potato and trying to squeeze the juice out of it. Ugh. There are all sorts of sexual innuendos. And I just wonder how many of the adults that were, you know, part of putting these scenes together and laughing in the writer's room were actually sick to their stomach as they gave the green light for these scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that from what is described in this documentary, there was no going against Dan Schneider, unless you just wanted to get a job at yogurt land or have your, you know, <laughs> and have your career completely over. Like, like they interviewed this one cameraman and he talks about how, yeah, there were so many weird things that were in the show that were total innuendos and insinuating things that were not appropriate for children. And he just said, oh, but there was no speaking up, you know, right. and this is like, this is the time I bring this up later on. But this is a time pre me too. This is like early aughts. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just like advocacy is not a super big part of the conversation, especially not like it is today. Yeah, absolutely. There's a costume one of the children has to wear and there are penises, like very clear penises on it. And the whole joke is that, you know, he has a prosthetic nose, but the prosthetic nose once enlarged on a costume looks very phallic and very Mm -hmm. much like a penis and testicles. Um, These really humiliating, degrading scenes. There's the pickle man and there's a scene where they put a pickle through a hole in a wall, like a glory hole. I mean, things that are just like, to be honest with you, I don't even know when I knew what any of this meant, but I think I was like in my late twenties. Yeah, it's just hardcore graphic content. It's, that right, yeah, and it's it's stuff that obviously children are not going to understand, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It's not for them. It was for the amusement of adults, I guess, or you of, know, the people yeah. writing it. Which makes you question, though, is it really for their amusement, or is Dan Schneider a sicko who got off on right. this, not just laughing at it? 
That's yeah. that's I mean, really the question. I'm sure there was a part of him, maybe a very large part that was like, wow, look at how much power I have. I can make these kids do this wild stuff and nobody's going to bat an eye and the show's just going to get so many good ratings and I just look at what I can get away with. Well, he says in an interview, you know, I can put these kids in any sort of humiliating situation mm -hmm. I want. And there's one actor who was interviewed and he says, he describes scenes that look innocuous to us. They are not sexual in nature. Um, but it's like, okay, a pound of sugar is going to get dumped into your open mouth, right? Or pounds of it. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to do this over and over. And they talk about right. how disgusting this was and how their mouths would congeal with so much sugar Ugh. in it. Their saliva would get so thick. They would almost choke on the sugar. They show one actor being lowered into peanut butter head mm -hmm. first, which actually looks quite scary to me with having yeah. your airways Ugh. blocked. Um, yeah, frankly, physically dangerous it's, and scary situations. Yeah, it's like they took slapstick humor to a really graphic sexual level, and they're like, "This is our danger. This is our shtick. This is like, this is what the this is what people like. This is what the laugh track, you know, is for." It's just mm -hmm. something else I want to talk about, Lauren. Yeah, is the way that we see Amanda Bynes in mm. this. And we yeah. see her her rise to child stardom and how mm -hmm. she is just like so she is Dan Schneider's prodigy, I guess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they are very close. He is the one making these shows happen. The Amanda show happened for her. And she's obviously so talented. Um, and it's just kind of bizarre, their relationship. You know, there's like a scene where they're in a hot tub together and they're talking about their working relationship. And it's just she's just young and it just all feels odd to look at now. Well, I what mean, did you think? I think that you look at these child stars, right? And so many of them go off the deep end. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that they're robbed of is the ability to, as an adult, forge their identity and forge their own success. Um, mm -hmm. Because a lot of these child stars, they don't actually transition into adult stars. And we have this weird thing where in our culture, we call people one hit wonders, or we kind of degrade people who aren't successful in the limelight forever. Right. I mean, how lucky to even have one hit people should feel. But I think that child stars get ridiculed as like, oh yeah, you know, imagine Hillary Duff didn't have the career she has or didn't really kind of parlay things into a different position. Mm -hmm. She would just forever be Lizzie McGuire, you know, embarrassing right. Lizzie McGuire. How embarrassing washed that up. was that she's washed up, never did yeah. anything else. And then also I think that Bachelor stars go through this, right? Where they yeah. become these mini celebrities, right? And right. they know what it's like to have offers for five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars for an mm -hmm. Instagram post or some all these crazy deals, and right. then to go from that back to selling software is really hard, right? Yeah. I think child stars they go from being in the limelight, so beloved, and then they can't transition to being adult stars. And it's like the wheels kind of come off the bus because yeah. they have had it so good for so long and that money does run out. You know, who knows how much their parents spend of it. It's not infinite. It can't support them for the rest of their lives in any sort of way. They're probably, you know, accustomed to being in Hollywood. And so, yeah, it's, it's a really, really I, horrible thing. And sorry, I'll just finish with this. I yeah. think that we see Amanda Bynes completely breaking down in public. We see so many child stars, mm -hmm. Justin Bieber, having clear issues, right? Right. And you wonder, is this the result of PTSD from being sexually abused? Is this just because you are overworked? What is I mean, this? I think there's just no way to develop normally as a child star. You know, it's it's hard for adults to be famous and like right. and keep a keep a grip on their mental health. So of mm -hmm. course children who from a very young age are thrust into this, of course they're not going to be able to figure it out. And the ones that do, I, I think it's like a miracle. It really is. And I just think that as a culture, we just need to have more kindness and more respect toward people. I think we should delete the phrase washed up from our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I think that every person's life is a journey and it's going to have highs, it's going to have lows. And I just, I think that the things we talk about with Kate with regard to this documentary are really important questions to ask. I completely agree. You know, Lauren and I even talk about situations we've had at our corporate jobs where we were made to feel uncomfortable. And so, yeah, it's just a really important conversation. Definitely a heavier episode, I'll say. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and <laughs> we do get in with Kate about Kate Middleton. We talk about Kate Middleton. We talk about another quick topic. So just an FYI, there's about 10 to 15 minutes of chatter before we get to her thoughts on Quiet On Set. But Kate's the best. So we're so excited she came on. And we really hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Yeah. Well, 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 we are gathered here today by <laughs> the one, the only... <laughs> Huge in the industry, by the way, that's quotes from our producer when we discussed having you on, Kate Casey. Kate Casey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I feel like we look related. <laughs> we, You are the Sisters. third blonde. I will happily join the family, although they probably <laughs> wouldn't accept me, but I'll do it. We have they a would. few new listeners right now, and so I just want to enter them to Kate Casey if they are not already very familiar. Kate, you host Reality Life with Kate Casey, and you are really just a an unscripted savant, an unscripted genius. You just are so adept at really talking about unscripted television in a way that's intellectual, that's thoughtful, that's not just the same basic conversation everyone's having. You also interview producers, people behind the scenes, writers. Your show's highbrow. It's really fun. It's really engaging. And so we love to have you on anytime there's an unscripted series or documentary we want to talk about or Housewives, anything like that. So we are bringing you on to talk about Quiet on Set. We have some things we want to get to first, but I just want to intro you, share your credentials with our listeners so that they can also tune into your podcast once this Well, I appreciate over. that. Thank you. And likewise, my friend. Thank you. Um, so we... We're going to collaborate. We're going to do a little swap and go on each other's shows a few weeks ago. But then Kate Middleton happened. And so before we talk about Quiet on Set, I have two things I want to get into. The first is I have not heard your take on Her Royal Highness Princess Catherine of Wales. Well, I actually have. I'm only like two degrees of separation. So I knew she was very sick. Okay. And I think for a long time, I was sort of baffled by the fumbling on the part of Kensington Palace. I should note that I had previous to my podcast, I ran my own crisis media uh, relations firm, global media um, strategy firm for law firms. Mm. So mm. I think I have sort of a different window as somebody who is averse in what companies should do in a time of crisis. So mm -hmm. I was always sort of baffled by their lack of transparency you have two options in this situation. You can be either completely quiet or you can be completely transparent. But mm. in the middle world, mm -hmm. it, it's too murky. And then that's yeah. why people start to ask questions. So you could either come forward and say, we're in the midst of, of a health crisis and we will give you more details as they're, as they're available and then leave right. it. Right. Right. Yeah. Or you just don't comment at all. They would just do these really sophomoric moves mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know the picture it all just was very strange to me i think that they have probably a lot of moving parts there with mm -hmm. charles health um trying to figure out when i say succession i mean who within the inner orbit will take on more roles their messaging and i think that ultimately the problem that they've had is a, a very common problem that a lot of people face that run corporations, which is that you have a staff that's probably not at a level of which they could handle a crisis of this capacity, meaning mm -hmm. her health issue, his health issue, Prince mm -hmm. Charles, or King Charles. They have likely had the same staff for many years and they're not adept at modern media. Mm -hmm. And then couple that with a non-compliant client. So a mm -hmm. client that's either not available at all or is mm -hmm. completely in disagreement with the communication staff. What they should have done long time ago is to either hire a crisis media firm to work in tandem with their current communication staff or scrap the communication staff and get a whole new staff. And I think they've just basically kept the same staff. Maybe if there was a crisis person, they maybe gave like some advice but they weren't actually like right. paid yeah mm -hmm. so that's what it comes down to you have an inept communication staff and a non-compliant client and by client are you saying kate yes client meaning the entire royal family the key members 
Yeah. Because mm-hmm. like, for, for example, like when, at the White House, the press secretary is purposely told almost nothing. And that's because mm. they're not going to flub up and say something. They like keep them purposely with little information. So, I mean, I have empathy for both. I have empathy for the communication stuff and for the client, which is the royal family member. But mm-hmm. in times of crisis, you have to have like all hands on deck meeting. Everyone ha- you, basically as a crisis communications manager, you go to the client and you say, we're closing all the doors. We're pu- pu- pulling the curtains down, turns off your cell phones. You mm-hmm. need to tell me everything so that I am able to help you th- walk you through this. I'm going to calm you. I'm going to walk you through the steps we have to take. But if you have a communication staff that does not know how to handle that mm-hmm. and also doesn't have the respect of the client, it sounds mm-hmm. to me like the royal family probably knows that the communication staff is not adept or they're purposely keeping them because they can tell them what to do. Right. Versus a crisis manager is going to go, right. you've totally fucked this up. Right. And now we're taking over. But, you know, they have a whole weird system there. You know, it's not, it's not a meritocracy always. It's Mm-mm. usually based on rank and who you know. And so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very complicated. It absolutely is. I think there's something to the idea that they have a staff that they can control um, and so they can make bad decisions. I will say that it's still very strange that it took so long to get that video made. You know, you know what? At, at co- a, like a very human level, I think yeah. too, it's not that complicated. I think mm-hmm. a woman who is going through a health crisis, who's getting treatment, and it's completely unpredictable how your body will react. Mm-hmm. is the most photographed person in the entire world. Literally everyone in the world spoke about her last week. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter where you are in the world, everyone who's who she is. Yeah. She probably doesn't want to be photographed. Yeah. She doesn't feel but, great and mm-hmm. doesn't want to be out there. I think that that's really, I, there are people that are like, is she dead of a, it's like, I just think it's pretty simple. Like if we had the stomach flu, we don't want to be photographed for the family photo. Right. <laughs> But if you're going through chemotherapy treatments, you do not want to be photographed or videoed. But the responsibility is on the communication staff to communicate that. Mm -hmm. And you have to set a boundary for the entire world. And you say, we are overwhelmed with with the love and support of the world. And we just ask you for some time for her to receive her treatment in privacy and to heal. And she will be back to talk Mm -hmm. about it and will undoubtedly give love and support to everyone else who is also seeking cancer therapy at this time. You just set a boundary Mm -hmm. when you're not really like you don't set a boundary. That's when people start to pick away at it. Mm -hmm. But what was their aim then with the mother's day photo? Like why put out Because I, I really believe none of this would have lit like lit on fire without the mother's day photo. And then the follow-up Photoshop error story. I think mm-hmm. they're just what? scrambling. I think I think that all of the news organizations are calling their press and they're like w- demanding, where is she? What is going on? They mm-hmm. go back to the client. The client's like, we don't want to give anything. And then somebody in between makes a really huge error. Yeah. But that's totally typical when you have a communication str- struggle and the client is not in communication with their staff. I think that there is more to the story. I think that... There didn't even need to be a video. If she had quickly done an audio recording with the BBC and had basically gone on just audio and said, I'm undergoing some health, you know, some yeah, health people treatments. That. And yeah. if we could hear her voice, hear her relaxed, hear her, that, yeah, that you know, completely great. okay, but just saying, I really want my privacy right now and had just said, Usually I'm totally fine having my photo taken, but I think everyone can understand during this time, I'm not in a place where I want to be seen. And I just really appreciate everyone giving me some privacy at this time. It was, it was having no sign of life that I think led everyone, including us specifically, especially to spiral totally, which leads me to believe though, that there's a reason it took so long. And I don't think it was, and we won't belabor this. I know people are like, let's get to the next thing. I don't think it was just waiting for her kids to be out of school. Something is, in my opinion, majorly off there. Um, but and also, we'll, we'll see what happens. But also, I have several friends that are going through treatment right now for cancer. Mm-hmm. And 
your timeline, your life is so in flux. You are so, mm. you, there's a period of shock where there may be people contacting her saying, what do you want us to say? But she may have been in a space where she's like, my head is spinning and I just don't know what I'm going to even do tomorrow. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's best case. You know, I, I hope you're right. Um, I absolutely hope you're right because obviously we don't want to think any of these other theories could be correct. Before we get to quiet on set, I do need your thoughts on news that broke this morning. That's really major. Oh, I know. And what you're <laughs> I think that we just have to discuss it. Like mm-hmm. we, it would be, it would be irresponsible of, of us to not discuss mm-hmm. it, which is that Teresa Nist and the Golden Bachelor, Gary, are reportedly <sighs> not living together anymore. <gasps> um, or they're I didn't living know this. separately. Yeah. Yeah. Kate, I need your thoughts. I didn't even know her last name until I saw that article, by the way. Um, I mean, listen, duh. I mean, the guy clearly only chose her because he thought he could get a sweet house in Charleston, South Carolina. I mean, I think he was such a grifter. The minute the ex-girlfriend came out and said, like, I live with him for a long period of time and he made me like half go half seas on the bills. I was like, who in the bachelor staff did not do the due diligence to realize this guy was a grifter. I'm not surprised. I hope to God what happened is that long after the wedding and the cameras went away, her yeah. kids said, by mm-hmm. the way, can we do like, can we get an annulment? Cause this guy right. is like itching for our, our stash and I don't appreciate it. Teresa, Teresa, unless we can move into the house in Charleston, <laughs> North Carolina, I'm really not comfortable uprooting my life from this lake. We worked so he hard. He hates Tony. that lake house. He cannot wait to get the hell out of that lake house. I just. Anyway, and remember I, when they showed the lake house? I was like, "This is the guy they chose." This, this I is know the dream his, house. The dream his life? easy boy lounger, that black leather easy boy lounge lounger with the cup holder. Like really, but talk about, this talk is about the, crisis the, the dream media. <laughs> remember, it was like two days before the finale aired, and yeah. remember the girl did the interview, and it like the whole interview came out. I was like, "Now that's a shit storm." That's when you call Gary in Mm -hmm. and the communications like crisis team and you go, all right, we'll give it to us. Like what the hell really happened to his ex-girlfriend? But he's also probably a liar. So, well, it wasn't serious. It wasn't serious, but she lived with you for two years. This is like, why don't they hire us to do interviews with these candidates? Well, I think that, I think that here's the problem. I think that, and kind of this happens in the Quiet on Set documentary, but the people they're interviewing, they can't hold their feet to the fire. Otherwise, those people won't agree to the interviews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a little bit of the issue. I will say this though, the reasoning that they gave that they're not living together is that the Golden Bachelor, Gary and Teresa, it's just a big hassle to move, apparently. Mm. It's just a lot of work to move. Is that like I'm an sorry, old, when you're, old, old person thing? <laughs> when you're newly in love, you will move mountains, heaven and earth, especially we don't know how much time we have left. <laughs> like We have well, to get married all, I tomorrow. think she works. She works and she spends a lot of time with her, kid, yeah, her, bonds, her, her grandkids. Stocks. What is Gary doing? Oh, I like I never got an answer on whether or not he works. Like he's like a rinky tink guy. Like he'll go and like fix your doorknob. But I, I don't know what else he does. Yeah, wasn't it's, he working for like the retirement home or something? I like, mean, yeah, doing being like the handyman. You it know? sounded Nothing pretty sketchy. Yeah, yeah, either has mailbox money or I don't know. Was running some sort of internet scam. No, game. he I was don't know. working as a handyman. You don't have mailbox money if you're working as a handyman. By the way, Kate introduced me yeah. to the phrase mailbox. Yeah, money. I don't know what that means. Kate, take mailbox it away. money is somebody who has like family money who just like goes to the mailbox and cashes their checks. <laughs> and Damn, you know, I'd we love, know people that are like that. Yes. Like, I'm really working so hard. And then you're like, what do you do? (laughs) And then you find out, like, they have family money. Right. They're getting a direct deposit every two weeks. And they're always the people that say they're so busy. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So busy. Do you know what they're so busy last night? You know when sometimes you DM people when you've had too much wine? Sure. Uh, Yeah. Or you post to stories, which is what I tend to do. (laughs) And then Wait, immediately delete I, I just it have to read this later. because I feel like people will laugh at this. So, you know, a part of my job's headache is I try to have to, you know, book talent. And oh it's always annoying because you got to go through like the network sometimes. Yeah. If you don't do that, you have to go to, mm-hmm. straight to the talent and they're annoying. So anyway, I asked this one person from a reality show, like we need to schedule the pod. And she says... Oh, no. She wrote to me and said, we need to schedule the podcast. And I said, okay, your publicist said May. And then I wrote WTF. 
like it's it was like the end yeah. of March. Like oh, oh my gosh. oh oh you're so you for one month you're yeah. so busy. Mm-hmm. I said WTF? Let's just do it. And she says, Yeah, April is effed for me. <laughs> this is what I wrote back. I have five kids and do six episodes a week. I can find time for an interview. You can too. Good for you. But then I read it. I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of harsh. But that that is pretty Obsessed. bold. Did she respond? No, but she read it. <laughs> I was I like, she's coming I mean, on there, your show. There's page. no excuse. Ooh. That's a mic drop DM. That in my is opinion. so stupid. But that's the mailbox people. They're always yeah. so busy. Like, okay. So let's get into Quiet On Set. Quiet On Set is a docuseries that uncovers the toxic culture behind some of the most iconic children's shows of the late 1990s and early 2000s. It has currently aired four parts with a fifth and final part slated for release on April 7th. Kate, have you interviewed any of the producers, any of the stars of Quiet On Set? What can you share with us just right off the bat about this docuseries? So I interviewed the two directors, two women brought this uh, to the network. One had already done the New York Times documentary on Britney Spears. Mm. And so she worked in collaboration with the other producer. And I think that the New York Times documentary series is excellent. They really like to focus on pop culture stories. So they explained that it was a process getting people to come forward. Mm -hmm. It really kind of began, it sparked their interest with Jeanette McCurdy's book. Mm, and then it was the process of like trying to find people in that space who were willing to come forward obviously drake bell that was a big get having him say so much about what his experience was but there had been rumors about dan schneider for quite some time Mm -hmm. uh it seems that he had done an op-ed in like 2021 i believe it was like during covid where i think that he did it as sort of like a glory piece like look at how fantastic i am but it Mm. actually sort of made people kind of like peek more into his backstory Mm. so it did the opposite for him i think what's interesting about quiet on the set is that there are two stories that are very troubling about the period of time in which he was at the helm of many successful nickelodeon shows the first is that he created such a toxic work culture so for Mm -hmm. the people that worked under his direction the amount of pressure and bullying they experienced. And then separate to that are the experiences of the children that worked on, on that set. And, and then attached to that would also be their parents. It's interesting because I look at the children that really were the most well-known around that time period on, on Nickelodeon. And most of them, especially most of them that were interviewed, their careers just sort of dissipated. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think like, was it all worth it? Because I think that especially having children of my own, I live outside of Los Angeles. I can't tell you how many people when they have new, like new babies, toddlers, they really believe that their child is the most precocious, wonderful child that ever existed. Yeah. And it can be very alluring when someone tells you your child is so cute and funny and people, especially around here, get very sucked into the idea of their child becoming an entertainer. Mm -hmm. but at what cost? And so when you see all of these adult children and some of them still harbor resentment for their parents, even as adults, they're like, well, Mm -hmm. one in particular was sort of like, well, you know, it's your fault. I wasn't successful because you complained. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, it's this, these two worlds and both issues at really need to be looked at the toxic work environment that's created on television sets Mm -hmm. Uh, the the, the amount of power one person can have, the executive producer and the showrunner. And then separate to that are the the experiences of children who were on sets for way too long. Mm -hmm. They're, although they need to have a parental figure on set, I mean, no parent is there witnessing every single thing. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people when they watch that, is particularly the scenes where Ariana Grande is like gripping a potato Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Ugh. water bottle the, to us in the year 2024, we're like, how was this ever passed? possible? Now, yeah. Dan Schneider has come forward and said there were a number of people besides myself that that greenlit scenes. It went through, you know, a, a, a ton of people. So essentially saying, like, it's not just me. It was fine with them. Why shouldn't it be fine with you? But I think it also shows you how 
when somebody is as powerful as he was, people sort of look away because they're already concerned about their own positions of power. Mm-hmm. Like that, that d- definitely seems awful. I, I'm not comfortable with it, but the, the entertainment industry is such an industry of like, I got to do what I have to do to get ahead. Yes. Right. And if Cut that throat. means I have to do all of these nefarious things, I have to look away. It's the only thing I can do in order to survive in this industry. So I think it's interesting that Quiet on the Set came out at the same time that we're kind of seeing this P. Diddy reckoning. And we're taking yeah. a look at all of these performers, Justin Bieber mm-hmm. and Usher, Usher in particular, who lived with him for a period of time and he was their mentor. Mm-hmm. I think we're experiencing a full reckoning in our country in particular about uh, actors and, and musicians and what, what, what is expected of them and the mm-hmm. orbit of people that are supposed to protect them. Mm-hmm. I think as well, you know, there's something about when you're plucked from obscurity as a kid. I remember being mm-hmm. a kid and, you know, someone approached us at the mall and I was like, oh my gosh, that would be my dream. Like it's the dream life. And mm-hmm. I think there's this like idea of, you know, is this just like the cost of having this, you know, one in a million experience where you're just, also- you know, thrust into fame and, and then you're supporting your family. Because mm-hmm. like you've given right. your family the dream life and then the added pressure of that. And, you know, I think people now are more are hopefully waking up to. Yeah. Is it worth it? Can you be normal? Yeah. I mean, is it even is it fair and is it OK to have children employed in this way mm-hmm. and to have child stars at all? Should child stars even exist? Period. I don't I don't know even know if it's possible anymore. It's yeah. just it's really just. You know, I have a friend who has a child who is like a social media star and I feel like I'm even more concerned about them because while well, there's like the, the Coogan law and there are some adjustments that the industry is trying to make in order to ensure that they're paid adequately, but protections, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. social media, there's nothing. That's like the wild, wild west. So mm-hmm. I almost, with, you would think that with stories over the last few years that have come out that it's like a, a like a wake up call, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's like whack a mole, and now we have social media that is mm-hmm. even a worse place. Right? I just don't and parents know. are doing it to their own children, and they depend yeah. on the, their child's content to survive. Yeah, and I just don't know if we're ever going to reach a place where social media is going to be quote unquote safe enough for kids to make money off of it or to be able to handle the evils of it. You know, mm-hmm. as a if they want to, you know, work in that industry, I just, yeah, I mean, adults can barely handle it. I also yeah. think there's a question of, I mean, you know, getting into the social media thing, there's a question of your right to anonymity um, as just a child to mm-hmm. have people not know what you look like to, I mean, Chandler and I having experienced just a tiny bit of going viral and all of a sudden, you know, it's crazy. I got recognized twice in New York when I was there. Um, and I just was like, very interesting. You know, we went viral on this very small scale. So imagine if you are mm-hmm. the child of a parent who's putting your face all over their social media when you're eight years old, 12 years mm-hmm. old, you do not consent to it. Um, or you, there's no ability to really consent to it. And then really know what your identity, to. yeah, is just stripped from you or the, you know, your, the narrative about you is created by your parents. Um, and I just, yeah, it, it seems to me like it really should be illegal. Well, I also think, uh, particularly, again, I mentioned those scenes with the potato and the water bottle, a lot of the, 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 the feet scenes, when you're an adult, and that's like a re-traumatization, when you look back at those scenes that right. several adults let you move through, the yes. dialogue, the scene, how do you get past that? They knew exactly what was going on. Right. I can't imagine like adults saw that and they weren't creeped out, but that, that it seems like the writers just felt so powerless, but it's interesting because there were five writers on set and two mm -hmm. were women. They asked Mm -hmm. the two women to split their salary, which is Mm -hmm. right. Insane. Insane. The the one writer, she was basically fired after the first season. She Mm -hmm. says that most of the really troubling footage happened after her so then we're talking this is probably replaced by a man so maybe there was like one woman on set so you have um well you know it even goes back to me like i couldn't get past like so there's this adult very adult stuff like 40 50 year olds writing dialogue for teens 
Mm-hmm. Like that's right. already like, wait, what? Um, but because the shows did well, they kept adding more shows and he's amassing more power. Mm-hmm. And he, he's at a point where like most people who are sociopaths, they feel like the rules don't apply to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. 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 I think that there's also just, you know, in that time when you couldn't start a YouTube channel or start a TikTok, you know, there were only so many jobs and so many people wanted to have a creative life and work in a creative profession and getting one of those jobs is so hard. So you're, you're not just irreplaceable, but you're irreplaceable like in the next 60 or you're, I'm sorry, you're so replaceable and you're replaceable immediately. Someone yeah. is ready to push and yeah. shove and to facilitate a, a, a phallic potato scene with a 12 year old in order to have your job immediately. And then also these people have families to support. You understand why good people could have potentially been complicit in really wrong things. The question I have is, it strains my credulity to think that networks didn't know exactly what was going on. So my question is, are networks just lazy where they don't want to have to deal with finding a new Dan Schneider? There's tons of talent in Hollywood. Hard to imagine they couldn't just find a new one. Or are they complicit? Are they are networks that, like people say filled think about with numbers. pedophiles it's and just numbers, 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 yeah. numbers really? advertisers that they're so beholden to investors and numbers that they're like, this is working. Let's keep yes. it working. Can don't we change make it. it even work better? Don't change it. They would rather mm-hmm. do that. Whether or not a child is being used is like the least important to them, yeah. unfortunately. Right, right. But I mean, yeah, you have to have all these things set in place to protect. And they're like, well, that means more counsel. Mm-hmm. There's gonna, I'm gonna have to get more like therapists. This is gonna drain from the bottom line. They're constantly looking at the number lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that I think that obviously points to a larger problem, right? Where mm-hmm. The only thing that matters is more money and more of a bottom line and value to shareholders. And we've just set up an entire culture where that is what, you know, most people are concerned with. I think another another aspect of this is that this was all pre Me Too. Like this was just all pre Mm -hmm. any type of public reckoning where it was like, Mm -hmm. how are people being treated in these professions? How are they being jeopardized or how are they made to feel unsafe? You know, it took so long even for women to have that moment. Of course, children, you know, we're just bottom of the totem pole, you know, so to speak, unfortunately. Yeah. Also think that a lot of those parents, they may have been fearful because he was so manipulative in the way that he would dangle the opportunity for said child to have their own spinoff. So it's like when anybody would rise up to say something when it came to the actors, Oh, but you know, are you sure? Because, you know, we were kind of thinking of this whole show that you might have it. I feel like it's so similar to people on a micro level. Like when you work at a job Mm -hmm. and you, you're like, this is so unfair. The system is not working for me. I should probably leave. Oh, but you know, we were thinking of giving you this project. Right. So I think what's most upsetting for so many people watching that is obviously how children were, were used and abused. But I also think there is a thread to it that is so relatable to anybody who's ever worked for a mm-hmm. company, especially if you have been a woman. I remember yeah. at my corporate job, my I worked with an art director. We were partners and we were referred to as the girls. Like that was our, and I, to that moment, that was like, anyway, and this was like 2017. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, I was just saying, I, I think we all have countless experiences where in a workplace, we have been put in a position where we have been kind of degraded or we've been sexually harassed or we've just been low-key in a position where we have to be complicit to s- some sort of laughing off of a situation mm-hmm. yeah. um, in order to be cool or to be not annoying or not to uptight. be likable. I remember I had one situation where a boss, um, he showed me in a group of and I was in his office with a few other guys and he showed me a picture of one of the, uh, I think it was a, f- I, I can't remember if it was him or someone else that was in the room, but um, they had hired a photographer and he, and this person who was in the photograph had gone up behind her and um, simulated thrusting into her while she was taking a photo. Um, and he said, isn't this hilarious? And what I saw was a woman trying to work and being mm-hmm. sexually harassed, to put it mildly. And I didn't think it was funny at all, you know, because as a woman, you just 
you want to be taken seriously and you want to be able to execute in a professional environment and not be sexualized. And I remember I said, like, I don't actually think that's funny whatsoever. And you do, you risk this, you risk being likable. And honestly, being likable is very commercially valuable and lends to being hired again. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think I actually felt safe enough to say that in that job, but a lot of people don't. They don't feel yeah. safe enough to say well, the right thing. Especially if you're a child. Right. You know, and, and you maybe one know. of those one of those kids says to their parent, I'm uncomfortable about this, and their parent is reliant on their income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so uh, upsetting. I want to talk about Drake Bell because I know we, we don't have yeah. very much time left, but I think we should absolutely I want to talk about that because that episode, I I felt so sick to my stomach. I, I dry heaved during that episode. I was crying. It was the way that basically everyone failed him. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just, I, I, I had no idea about what had happened to him. Obviously that, you know, only now do we know that he was the John Doe or whatever in that case. Um, and it's just so awful. I'm just going to top line it for people who haven't watched. So Drake Bell was sexually abused by, um, by Brian, Brian Peck. Peck. Yeah. yeah, who was on the set. I forget his official role, but he was on the set of Drake and Josh. And so, and this guy was sexually abusing him horrifically, you know, in a very repeated way, harassing him. Um, very, very horrible to hear this account. So anyway, just want to give that and just context. I'll just add a little bit more texture to that. I think what is so awful and horrifying about what happened to Drake is that, you know, his dad was his manager from the get-go, basically. And his dad noticed the weird behavior of Brian towards Drake and to other, you know, boys. He talked about how he saw a video of him and Leonardo Di of Brian and Leonardo DiCaprio, and he's kind of rubbing Leonardo's arm and touching his waist and just like creepy stuff. And so his dad said, hey, you know, his dad kept a very watchful eye over Drake and Brian and even said, something's kind of off with this guy. And then his dad was someone at the show once he mentioned how he felt you know like brian was creepy his someone said to his dad well you know he's gay are you sure you're not just homophobic mm -hmm. and then you know brian this master manipulator pedophile then starts to put distance between drake and his dad you know starts to like you know put a little bird in his ear that his dad's stealing his money yada 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 not good finally for your career no one wants him drake, around drake says yeah. i want my i want my mom to be my manager i don't want you in my life or you know i don't trust you and so his dad, literally his parting words to his, to Drake's mom was just don't let him be alone with Brian. And then from there on out, he was, you know, Brian had access to him and molested him. I have such great respect for when any victim comes forward, especially when they are an adult and in an industry that is, br is relentlessly brutal. Mm -hmm. And that this undoubtedly was humiliating for him to talk about. But I have to believe that Drake Bell is going to save so many children yeah. because of what he did. And for that, I hope that there's like some small silver lining and that he feels like he gained some of his power back because of all the people that he will save. And I hope that his career, because of it, people in Hollywood who have maybe cast him aside or forgotten about him, remember the talent that made him a hit in the first place and he gets the work that he deserves. Okay, I have to bring something up because I do agree with you that, you know, it's so important that he's come forward. Um, and you talked in the beginning of this episode, you know, why aren't they hiring us to interview the Golden Bachelor, Gary, and hold his feet to yeah. the fire? Well, I'm not sure if a lot of people know this. They briefly gloss over this, that there are accusations against Drake Bell. Um, and so I'm interested in the, you know, victim to perpetrator trajectory that seems all too common because there is a case where a 15 year old has gone on the record in court saying that he, um, that, you know, and this is going to get graphic, but that when she was 15, she gave him oral sex backstage at one of his, sh in one of his shows. Um, and, you know, he kept telling her to hurry up and grow up basically, you know, I guess he said that when she was 15, um, and she was 17 or 19 when the case came forward. So still super young. And she was, you know, extremely impacted by this, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. She essentially met a child star she idolized and he abused her. So I think that there's a part of this that 
they obviously didn't tell because they couldn't get him to do the interview if they were going to tell this part of the story. But yeah. I think it's important to share because, you know, he really did um, become a per perpetrator himself. Well, unfortunately, I think it happens quite often. Um, and when that happens to you at a young age, it's so confusing and mm -hmm. you have no, no one to talk to and you have no mm -hmm. mental health help and you're angry. And I hope that in the end, everyone's story is told. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think do think you're right though, that there oftentimes that's the, the plight of the documentarians is that they worry too much. I'm not saying this one, I'm just saying in, in general, in general, if we tell that part, it's, it's going to take away from the big story. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's becoming more difficult for documentaries to be sold. There's just like, just no one's buying anything right now. Mm. And um, I just hope that people are mindful that the audience really relies on documentary filmmaking because they want to feel like they get the full picture. Yeah. So that's a tough one. Yeah. It really I could see the networks. I, yeah. I could see the network giving notes though. They may have, they could say to the network, okay, well there's this other part of the story they might say, mm -hmm. but that's not the story that we're telling. Also, part five is coming. So we don't know what's to come on April 7th That's true. in six days. Yeah. So yeah. we don't we don't know what else is to come. But I guess I I think I'm so super interested in the psychology behind all these people. Like I look at a Dan Schneider and I think, were you born sadistic? Or did you develop this? And my, you know, armchair psychologist theory is that as someone who probably didn't have a lot of luck with women, who got into a lot of porn, who became, you know, less satisfied with mundane things given that, you know, most of, you know, by consuming a lot of porn. And so you just get more and more deviant in your consumption. And then that starts to trickle into everyday life or into your life. Do you let out your frustrations well, I, that you I didn't interviewed, have success with the opposite sex? I don't know. I'm curious. I interviewed someone once and asked a question about that. And they said that pedophilia is the worst mental health problem. And there's literally nothing you can do to fix it. Well, I will they say need though to that be Dan Schneider is not accused of any children. pedophilia. He's not but accused the, of any sexual abuse. But the the story of Quiet on the Set touches on yeah. pedophilia, right? Um, definitely. So it 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 seems like having a national conversation is the best thing we can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that that they're accomplishing that because look at us we're we're talking about it. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that parents now moving forward, if their children are in the entertainment industry, I hope that everyone has their eyes fully wide open and, uh, you, you know, know I, are just I skeptical that of people, too. I, I was like, oh, of course, after people watch this, they're not going to. But the truth is people are so right now we live in like a, like a creator economy and mm -hmm. power is derived from how many numbers you have. And I'm afraid that yeah. there are a lot of people that will still look away because they're desperate to get oh, they're theme. completely desperate. But, I mean, people in other countries in the world sell their children online for that will do things online for strangers because they're completely desperate. Mm -hmm. Desperate it's people so do awful. desperate things. And that happens on every level of human existence. Yeah. One more thing about the Drake Bell case. I think the letter, the character letters that were sent by all those other celebrities at the time, you know, those were kind of just so awful to hear about and sickening because they basically say in a lot of the letters, you know, as they're writing to the judge on behalf of Brian Peck, they're saying, you know, he must have been tempted or there must have been some type of circumstance where he was unfortunately fell into this mm -hmm. and it just fully takes all the blame off of him. Or they even say like, he's remorseful. And it's like, it doesn't matter if he's remorseful. He shouldn't be right. anywhere around children. He should be prosecuted and put behind bars. Drake says that the, on the day of the sentencing or whatever, Brian Peck's side of the courtroom was completely full, which is just like, if I've, I, if I found out anybody I knew and respected yeah. was a child molester, I, I, I couldn't or stand accused by of that. Or mm -hmm. right. I mean, accused of that. I just, it, that was fathomless. My new favorite word from Katie Maloney. Yeah. That's just awful. Very upsetting. I, Something I was wondering about was, you know, was this during a time, you know, post Michael Jackson child abuse allegations where people just thought that it was like a cash grab or it was like, oh, well, they just want to tear down somebody successful. And I you recommend, know? I recommend so much watching Leaving Neverland, which is a documentary on HBO about the Michael Jackson accusers 
I actually did the only interview that that executive producer ever did. And mm. he talked about the harassment that he received just yeah. as a filmmaker. Bosh. I mean, yeah. That, I mean, that, insanity. That documentary, I watched it a couple of times because I was so morbidly fascinated by it. Um, I absolutely believe those boys. A hundred, those men. I know, 100% and believe I, them. I had friends who said, no way, that's a cash grab. I'm like, why would someone put their so- themselves through this humiliation? Right. To tell right. that story. Right. Yeah. And two two guys just happen to do it. But it's um, people in positions of power that gaslight people. Yeah. They've mm-hmm. they have like they're corrupt. And then when someone suggests that maybe they've used their power in nefarious ways, their reaction is to gaslight. Mm-hmm. And right. so you have a population of people that are like, it's a money grab. It's not a money grab. Discrepancy in power. How about them hiring back Brian Peck again after he was released? Disney. Because I think that networks are like, that person gets the job done to get the successful oh show. Gosh. We need to make the, the money. And it's Ugh. just that simple to them, that clear cut. It's crazy. It's almost like I, if you, you, your house is falling apart and you, because you've got a, like a, a slab leak. And the one person that can do the slab leak well and charges less money is a horrible person people oftentimes will hire that person to save themselves money and the, the well-being of these children is just not their top priority in any way it's like no. honestly probably not even on the priority no, because list. i think they're like well that's their par- the parents responsibility yeah, and not ours. right right and, right they're so removed from it i mean he was only in prison for 16 months or something crazy like that Awful. Yeah. Awful. Kate, anyway. I know that you have another interview you need to get to. Um, please share with our listeners where they can find you. So my podcast is called Reality Life with Kate Casey, and I have six episodes a week. In fact, tomorrow's episode is an, uh, all about hip hop and P. Diddy. So if oh, you good. are kind of like wondering about how he amassed his power and the relationships he has with like Notorious B.I.G., Tupac, Justin Bieber, Usher, all of that. I, I kind of give you the rundown. Um, you can find my Facebook group uh, on Facebook, Reality Life with Kate Casey. I have a weekly what to watch list, which is really important. Every Monday I tell you what to watch in unscripted TV. So reality shows, documentaries, and docuseries. You can get that at katecasey.substack.com. And um, yeah, subscribe. Yeah. Highly recommend Kate's Patreon. Thank you so much, Kate, for coming oh, on. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a big listener. So hey. um, really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you Love so you much. Guys. And we're so excited much. to so, have you back. So proud of you guys and your successes thank you. and how hard thank you've you, worked. Thank you. Love You're you guys. the best. Really. Thanks, Kate. Okay. Love you too.